Uh, good afternoon. Didn't we have a great morning session with Dr. Chan? I think all of us learned something powerful uh, about that experience, and it's this, that the Holy Spirit can speak to us and communicate to us and be quite invasive while we're laughing, <laughs> while we're smiling, uh, while we're crying. And uh, this morning was an, a session, and Dr. Chan, we thank you for the incredible wisdom that you brought. This afternoon is going to be no different. I want you to do what my young daughter told me to do years ago. It was a Wednesday night before service. I was praying. I was being super spiritual, sit, sitting in my chair, praying in the spirit, just me. And then she was about six, and now she's 28. And I was leaned back in my chair praying, and she walked over to me and put a hand on each cheek. And I had my eyes closed, so it kind of caught me off guard. And I opened them, and we were looking eyeball to eyeball. And she said, Dad, you might want to pray a little quieter. God might want to talk to you in person. I want to tell you, this afternoon, in any context, God wants to talk to us in person. So let's open our hearts and receive. What do you say? Amen. Welcome, Dr. Chan, back to the Refuel Conference. Dr. Chan. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, this is that session after lunch. So if you feel like going to sleep, just go right ahead. <laughs> just go right ahead. No need in fighting it. Uh, but if you can stay awake, that'll be cool too. If your snoring wakes up your neighbor, you may want to take it outside then, <laughs> but uh, they'll wipe your drool and keep on snoring. So it's, uh, is, is that session in which all the food is, action is here, but the brain is finding its own space. Let me see if you can uh, tell me what this is. All right since I got to tell you everything. <laughs> this is North America. This is South America. I'm very disappointed. <laughs> because you all are here somewhere. You should certainly know that. Uh, and then, let me get this out of here. And this is the Panama Canal. I'm, I'm sorry, I'll have to be redundant and tell you everything now, so it's going to slow me down a little bit. And this is the Atlantic Ocean, and this is the, yeah, I thought, Pacific Ocean. Uh, a few years ago, I was standing here at the brink of the Panama Canal. Anybody been to the Panama Canal? Okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, so you all know what I'm talking about here. I was standing there. And I noticed that they were widening the canal. Can someone tell me why they were widening the canal? Yeah, bigger ships. Because when they built the canal in 1913, they built it for the biggest, widest ships at that time. And you know they added yardage to it. But now, cities float. And so the whole notion was... If we're going to have bigger ships go through, and by the way, just for trivia, uh, the ships over here, the ships over here, they wait about 72 hours to get an appointment to go through, takes about 35 minutes to go through, and the average ship pays $1 million toll. Sounds like a lot of money, doesn't it? But when you figure that you got to go, if you went around the horn, it'll cost $5 million. So all of a sudden, one million is chump change, right? It's like, write a check. <laughs> when ships are going through, and the Panamanians realize that this is their, okay, and they, this is one million dollars average toll, and they have capacity to put 48 ships through there every day. 
So you do the math on that every day. Three, 365, every day, every day, every day, that's happening there. However, the widening of the canal caught my attention. It caught my attention because that reminded me of church. God is giving us bigger opportunities, bigger ships to go through. But our antiquated canals, our systems and our structures are not allowing for the bigger things to go through. So let me just kind of establish the fact that I'm talking to the right people. How many of you believe that what God is going to do is greater than what he's already done? How many of you believe that not just this district, but the church, capital C, has bigger, greater opportunities. We just had uh, Eric tell us about what the government is doing. How many believe that we have bigger opportunities than we ever had before? But the challenge of the church is that we are still trying to push bigger ships through antiquated processes. Systems that are designed for when it was good for that system to be designed. But the bigger, faster ships cannot go through our canal. Let me draw another picture and don't disappoint me this time. Yeah. Let me see if you all can tell me what this is. It's a train in case you're wondering. One day this will be worth something. And a train runs on what? Tracks. Question for you. Can you run a bigger, faster train on old tracks? No. Question number two. If you were to run a bigger, faster train on old tracks, what will happen to the train? It'll derail. Question number three. If the train is built to go 200 miles an hour and the tracks are built for 100 miles an hour, how fast is tra the train going to go? Ladies and gentlemen, that's church right there. God has bigger, faster plans for us, ready to go. But it is not the size of your vision. It's not the size of your opportunity. It's not the size of your money. It's not the size of your staff. It's not the size of your location. It is the systems and structures that your church is running on. So when I go to churches, I see everyone is excited about the great opportunities. But this is the messy work. This is messy work. And you can't go in here and just put a few more nuts and bolts in there and tweak it. You have to tear out the old tracks and put in new tracks. I graduated from Bible college in 1977. The world for which I was trained does not exist anymore. Church has changed. My father was a Pentecostal pastor in India. The way we did church, three-hour services. God did not start moving till two and a half hours. <laughs> if you know what I mean. I mean, it was like, yeah, try that now. We can do three services in three hours now. I was, three weeks ago, I was in KL, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, at a great church, they got five Sunday morning services, start at 7 o'clock, bam, 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 70-minute services with 25-minute uh, time to clean the bathrooms, windex the doors. About 3,000 people in every service. Five services. So how do you, <laughs> how do you do that and still retain what we Pentecostals call the moving of the spirit. And that is sometimes used as a good reason and sometimes used as an excuse. I'm here this afternoon just to challenge you to ask yourself, how do we redo 
our processes and our systems? How do we get beyond how we have done it to how we need to do it? So let me, let me break it down a little further, a little further. So when I go to churches, they got diagrams like this. What do we call that? A flow chart, right? So a system like that, without names in it, without names, is known as a system. Is known as a system. You put names in there, and it becomes a structure. System, no names. Put names in there, it becomes a structure. Most of your meetings that you have as your staff, as your leadership, are not about your systems. They're about people. Oh, she's not working out over here. She's not doing her job. You know what we should do? Let's promote her. <laughs> That's church. I didn't mean to hurt you all that early in the game. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's what we do. That's what we do. So most of our conversations are not about how do we redesign our systems. They are all about people. If you didn't have to have people conversations, life would be good, right? Right? but systems before people. Everything about systems. Okay, let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, Amazon, Amazon is eating our lunch. By the way, I sold out of my books. So if you want any more books, not just what I had, but others, you can just go to Amazon, samchand.com, or, or the samchand, and it's, it's all there. So you, you, can, they'll, you can get it. I sold it for 20 bucks. It's actually on Amazon for $14.99. I'm just telling you now. I wasn't going to tell you earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but church folk, you got to, you know, do a little bit of maneuvering. So uh, that's. <laughs> so what is Amazon? So where, where does Amazon grow its bananas? Nowhere. Where, where does Amazon stitch its clothes? Nowhere. Amazon is eating everyone's lunch. You know why? Because they are all about the systems. I, I, read, I read two days ago, Amazon is telling its employees, quit working for us. If you quit, we will give you $10,000 to start your own delivery business. It's all, it's all over the news. Because their system is, why do we want to pay FedEx and UPS when these startups will do it for us at much lower cost? Systems. Airbnb, what is that? What, do they own real estate? No. Systems. Uh, let me see what examples I can use. Uber, Uber, Uber. Uber, Lyft, whatever. Whichever one you like or don't like. Uber doesn't own any cars. All Uber is, is a more sophisticated taxi service. Because they went inside the consumer's mind and say, what are the pain points for consumers? Well, they don't know what kind of car they're going to get into. They don't know who's the driver. They don't know how far the taxi is. So now you go in there and it can tell you where the taxi is, where the car is, who the driver is, what kind of person it is. It gives you a tag number on it. You don't have to carry cash. It's already bam done in it. And I would highly recommend tipping them. Uh, but that is systems and structures. Systems and structures are very, very important. Good systems, bad systems. 
right people, wrong people. Good systems, bad systems, right people, wrong people. When you have good systems and right people, things are amazing. Plus, right? Things are chugging along. When you have wrong systems and bad, bad, wrong people and bad systems, you're going down. It's the Titanic. Whenever you go see the movie Titanic, there's no surprise there. It's not like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? No, that baby is going down. You can sniff death. You can smell death. I've been to lots of churches that actually died and are still walking. <laughs> so, wrong people, bad systems is going down. Good systems and wrong people, you're going to get average. Average results. I'm going to come back to that. You got bad systems, but right people, you're going to have frustration and attrition. People are going to leave. Frustrated people are going to leave. There should be an eye over here. I want you to get the next two sentences. Please hear them carefully. I'll repeat them for you because I think they're that important. If you have good systems but wrong people, good systems will pull wrong people up. If you have the right people and bad systems, it's going to pull the good people, the right people down. So high turnover, it really has to do with who is in charge, who is leading that, what systems do you have, how do you communicate with them, how do you value them, what do you, what do, you do with when people come through, how, how, how do you manage the volunteers in your church, because volunteers are the lifeblood of the church, right? You take... I mean, imagine for a moment, if your volunteers went on strike next Sunday, what are you doing? Not a whole lot. You're going to find out very quickly, volunteers, how, 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 how important they are. So the, the whole notion of having good systems in place and having system conversation rather than people conversation. You can have people conversation, but it's not always people. A lot of times it is the system in which the people are having to work with. And then you inherit systems too. So I know a little bit about the Assemblies of God. Even though I'm not AG, I get to dabble in AG and mess up. I've done, what, three councils already in the last three weeks. So, uh, you know, I get to mess up and run away. I'm a hit and run artist. Make trouble for the soup and then I'm out of here. That's, 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 that's my plan for the rest of the day. It's because there's a lot of transition. People go from one church to the other. You're going to inherit somebody else's systems. And you're going to inherit the trust that they had or did not. Have. You will pay what I call a trust tax. That means whatever happened back there that was negative is going to splash up on you. You cannot go in there saying, hey, I'm a new guy, I'm cool. No, you're going to pray for their sins. If there are sins, of course, all of us have moved around. And so processes are established by others and you end up inheriting processes. And then people get comfortable with those processes. And, and then you, if you start dealing with people, moving them around, you, you know the favorite song of the church? I shall not be... Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the favorite song of the church. Try moving somebody. So conversation 
as long as it's centered on she's not working out or he's not working out, it's going to be a small conversation and it's got higher collateral damage. But if you can have a conversation about system, okay, I'm going to give you a fantasy. I've got so many fantasies, so many fantasies since I'm not pastoring. <laughs> Here's a fantasy for you. If you could whiteboard your church, totally erase everything, whiteboard your church, and start all over again with the wisdom that you have now, with the knowledge that you have now, with the experience that you have now, with the good, bad, and different things that have happened in your life now, knowing what you know now, how would you organize your church? But you know what we do? We just keep adding on. Uh, anybody in here ever lived in a, in a country house? Uh, okay, uh, when I was pastoring in Michigan, I lived on a, on, a, on a road with 12 houses, and we were on a party line. Anybody know what a party line was? Okay, party line is there's one phone line, and everybody's on the same line. You think Instagram is great? <laughs> this is before Facebook. This is amazing. I mean, all you had to do was, there was an art to picking up the phone. And you picked up the phone and you could hear in to everybody else. So in the country, there were houses that started off nice and square. And then your first baby was born. You added a room. Then mother-in-law moved in. You added another room. Then you felt like you needed a place to work. And then another baby was born. And there's another bedroom here. And now nothing works. You're taking a shower here. They flush the toilet here. Revival breaks out. <laughs> this room is burning up. This room is freezing. To get to this bedroom, you gotta go through somebody else's bedroom. Anybody lived in a house like that? I have. That is church growth right there, <laughs> unfortunately. So, you had a, when you were there, you had a nice, square, concise, cogent vision, mission. You were going to go somewhere with it. You knew what you were doing. But then somebody came from another church, and they said, you know, at our other church, we used to. <laughs> and so you started this thing here. And then someone else come from another church. You know, at our other church, we used to. You start another thing. Don't you get tired of people talking about the church they came from? <laughs> I mean, after a while, you feel like saying, if it's so doggone good, <laughs> why are you here? Can I help you get back? <laughs> there are breadcrumbs. Just follow your way back there. <laughs> Homecoming, you know. Home. <laughs> and so we end up doing everything, everybody else's thing, and you wake up one morning, and it's not the church you were pastoring. It's nothing like you thought it was going to be because this is how it gets convoluted, and the system don't work. The plumbing doesn't work. The air doesn't work. The heat doesn't work. People going moving from one area to the other doesn't work. Nothing works. And, and you know what we do? Then we pride ourselves in, you know, making more boxes here. And then we have dotted lines. Nobody knows who's responsible to who. What happens? Who can you, you got to be able to contact one person to ask a simple question. And now nobody seems to know what really is going on. Or they make up stuff. I talk to church staffs all the time. They make up stuff. Absolutely. It could be true. All things are possible to those who believe. I wouldn't say anything that God couldn't do. So the, the whole notion of what are we going to do, systems and structures. And I know some of you are sitting here saying, you know, in the first session, he didn't say anything about the Bible. In this session, he ain't said nothing about the Bible. Give me Bible. Give me Bible. Give me. So 
For those of you with a religious spirit, let me throw a few Bible things in here. So you can leave me alone and kind of feel like he's saved. You know, I'm going to tell you, I got saved at when the age of seven. I've been saved off and on. <laughs> My theology allowed me to have off days and I'm cool with that. He cool with that too. Yeah, he leaves me alone on those days because he knows I'm going to come back. I have history of coming back many times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> if I'm creating problems for you, mission accomplished. <laughs> God created human beings on day six of creation, Genesis 1 and 2. Day six, he created human beings. So what did he do day one, two, three, four, five? He set the thermostat day and night. He created salmon and steak. Mm -hmm. That's what he did. He created avocados and strawberries. So we could have some guacamole. He created all the systems so that when he put the structure it could sustain life he spent five days creating systems and structures before he put human beings on the planet you know what we do we put people in there without any systems and structures uh, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro. I mean, don't you hate it when your father-in-law comes to you and, and tells you you're doing something wrong? <laughs> because he was seeing his daughter, Zipporah, getting neglected and uh, his grandchildren getting neglected because Mr. Moses was doing church work. He was at the church office all day long. Never came home. His kids were growing up without daddy. So... Daddy-in-law goes to son-in-law and says, hey, man, you're messing up. You don't need to do all this. And all of you have preached about this, how he said, divided into thousands and hundreds and fifties and so on and so forth. What did he do? He created systems and structures. Uh, you can jump into, I mean, I could go to the Bible. You, you could jump into the New Testament. So for First Corinthians chapter uh, 12 is about the gifts of the spirit. Chapter 13 is about the attitude, which is the love chapter that we call it. It's really not the love chapter. It's about the attitude in which you use your gifts. And uh, chapter uh, 14 is the systems and structures. This is how you do that. So that, you know, if you, not everybody gives a message in tongues. And if you have a message, if you don't have an interpreter, don't do that. Uh, two or three with, you know, prophecies and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is he created systems and structures. Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10. Uh, Jesus calls together his 70 disciples and he divides them into two and two teams of, that means 35 teams, and he sends them uh, chapter one, uh, chapter, Luke chapter 10 verse 1, the B part or the end part of verse 1 says, and he sent them into every city and village he was going to go into. So he had an itinerary and he sent them into those places. I'm talking about systems and structures. So, so the, I mean, the books of the Bible that we read for personal devotions, such as Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Leviticus. I don't even know how to spell Deuteronomy. Neither can you. <laughs> That's all about systems and structures. So what I'm, I'm talking about is, God, you know the Bible talks about God is a God of order. And the one thing that we are, that's holding the church back, I believe, especially in the times in which we are serving people, is not more anointing. It's not more God. I don't know if you can get more God. It's not like he comes like pizza by the slice. I mean, it's either all God or no God, right? So, but I understand what we mean by more God. It's, it's not more vision. Every one of us have got great vision. It is but when people come, things ought to work. 
When people come, things ought to have a system to it. There should be a pathway for it. There should be a predictable way of knowing the big picture and everybody understands how things work over there. Uh, it, it starts with getting the right people in the right place. For example, you know, I go to churches like greeters and ushers. You know what most greeters and most churches are doing? Greeting each other. And, and, and you don't want deeply spiritual, tongue-talking, prophetic people, greeters. You want people who are barely saved, who still know what it is to be happy. <laughs> who are not trying to do this? I'm blessed to be a blessing. No, man. Hey, girlfriend. <laughs> hey, you don't want any deep people out there. Deep people scare me. Bless God, bless God. Yes, praise the Lord. I do that on your own time. Right now we are in the shopping center, you know. <laughs> when, when, when you're having people who are talking to people who want to join your church or who are in your growth track, whatever you, want, you call it, in the intake, in the assimilation plan, you want people who are actually excited about being there. You want somebody who can actually communicate. Who, who, who does not just content and boring and dull? Who, that's why the attrition rate, the dropout rate, you can get 12 people in the room and the next time there are two. Why? Because you got the wrong person there. They're the boring, the daylights out of people. It's like, let me go. When will this be over? I know God saved us from hell, but this... I know people come into your mind and I know they're deep people and they love Jesus and they're all, all that and they've been doing it for 28 years but they're killing you. Should we stop now or should I keep going? Keep going, okay, keep going, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> so let me give you a few ways to think about it. It's 3.06. I plan to be done by 7 o'clock when I start the next service. So... So when we think, I'm talking about systems. From now on, I'm just going to talk about systems. Because I'm just trying to make a point here. The point is, it's not your anointing. It is not, it's the systematic way of doing things. It's thinking systemically. It is training your people to think how systems work. How everything is attached to the other. In, what was that song? Uh, your neck bone attached to your backbone. This attached to that. Everything is attached. If, if, if I stub my toe, my whole body responds. So, you, you ever been nailing something and you hit the wrong nail? <laughs> All of a sudden, words start coming out of your mouth that you thought you stopped. <laughs> hey, listen, you get saved, but your vocabulary is totally unsaved. If I was to say some of those words, I'm not going to say it, but if I was to say some of those words, you would know what they mean. It's not like, well, I'm saved and I don't, all things have passed away. No, they have not. They're still up there. <laughs> so as soon as you hit the wrong nail, immediately your whole body goes into motion, right? Yeah, I mean, all of a sudden you start sucking air. Like, <laughs> like has, what's that got to do with that? <laughs> you start hyperventilating, but it's the nail. It's not your lungs. And you throw it down and then all of a sudden you go like this, like putting it over here is going to take it away. And then, what's that all about? There's a system. There's a system. Most people who are thinking people who are competent people, who are passionate people, can sense and smell if you don't have systems. And they will, you can announce it all you want to, you can create videos all you want to, but they will not engage with you because they know. 
that their systems are default. So let me give you a few ways to think about it. Let's talk about systems to engage people. Three words, three words, three words. Heart, head, hands. Heart, head, hands. Heart, head, hands. Heart, head, hands. Heart, head, and what? Hands. Heart, head, hands. That is the pathway, the system of engaging. So when people come to your churches, don't get them to engage doing. This is, so with the heart, we feel. With the head, we think. With the hands, we do. So feel, think, do. Feel, think, do. Everyone together. Feel, think, do. Okay. Heart, head, hands. So just, when somebody walks in, you know, we are so desperate for people like, thank you for being here for the first time. Can you go teach a class for us? <laughs> well, pastor, I've never been to church. I'm not even saved. You're breathing, right? <laughs> go tell them a story about Joshua and the whale of the belly. <laughs> Daniel marching around the walls of Jericho. Just tell them a story. Yeah, some of you will get it later on. We're so desperate to move people up. The second piece of that I want to say to you is when people come from other churches, doesn't matter how anointed, doesn't matter how gifted, doesn't matter how they tell you God has called me to you, give them a rest. Let them detox. Let them get it out of the system. Let them unlearn where they came from and relearn where you are. Let them get your vision. Just because I can sing and lead worship at church ABC does not mean that I can get plugged into church XYZ. It's more than having a guitar around your neck and singing. I'm leading people into worship. If I'm leading people into worship, I got to know something about the culture of the church, the DNA of the church. What is my real role? What am, am I just a... Worship leader or am I actually part of everything that's going to be happening? Heart, head, hands. Feelings, feelings, feelings. So people say things like, don't go by your feelings. Don't go by your feelings. I'm here to tell you, every major decision you've made in life is a feeling decision. Who you marry? Okay, how many of you married? How many of you married? Can I see your hands? Married people, married people, married people. Some of you are kind of going like this. Are you Okay. All right? Married. There's nothing intellectual about who you're going to marry. It's all about feelings. It's all about body parts. It's not like she has a really deep prayer life. He really knows the Bible. I mean, after he's quoted you verses, what are you going to do? I'm like, pray, woman, pray. <laughs> Who you marry is a total fee. I mean, I remember when, when uh, Brenda was chasing me in Bible college. <laughs> Don't mess with my imagination. I remember one time uh, I had some cologne. In those days, it had to be that old spice. Oh, what was that in the green bottle? What is that? Oh, yeah, brood. Smelled like a nursing home. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had some, one of those things on me. And she said, mm, you smell good. I mean, I went and bought gallons of that. <laughs> because how she made me feel. I feel this is the Lord. I feel this is my church. People join your church and say, it feels like home. I feel the presence of the Lord. All the major decisions you've made in your life and will make in your life are going to be... 
feeling decisions. So when people say, you can go by feelings, we all do. You have. And you will. But once you get people's hearts, then you can do intellectual understanding of the vision and the mission and the purpose and the direction, the goal and the objectives before you engage them. Because if you engage people too soon, you're going to lose them soon. You engage my heart. See, that is why it's not about people giving. It's not about people giving money. It is about where a man's treasure is, their heart is also. So what I'm trying to do is get the heart. If I get the heart, I'll get the rest of it. If I can get the person, I can get the resources. A pathway of thinking. So the question becomes for all of us, when people come to our churches, how do we grab their hearts? See, nobody came to your church saying, I love their logo. <laughs> Whew, that logo, I mean, tell you, that logo. Every time I look at it, whoo! God comes all over me, that logo. Hmm, logo. <laughs> Most pastors don't even know what the logo looks like. They spend money on it. You know, back then. It's all right, it's all right. Carry on, carry on. <laughs> Let revival break out in that side of the church. Doesn't take much. So when people come to our church, how do they feel? What are we doing on purpose to create that feeling? How do we develop our frontline directors of first impressions, people in the parking area, people at the doors, people in the ushers? How do we, how do we create that feeling of warmth? That's where it's at. It's a way of thinking. When you're making decisions, let me give you three more words. When you're making decisions, it is choices, chances, changes. Choices, chances, changes. Choices, chances, changes. Everyone together. Choices. So when you come to a conference like this, a council like this, or go to anywhere, you're going to get pick up some good ideas, something that you want to do, something that uh, turns your crank, something that you say, you know, this was exactly what I need to be doing. I get that. Those are choices you're going to make. And we want to see some changes. But in between, there's another word called what? Chances. That's the risk part. So pastors sit in conferences like this, for example, and they're listening to what is being said, but they are translating all of that through the people still back home. That is why, can I say an aside, and this is not something that Pastor Tim has asked me to say, but as an aside, if you come to these, if you're a pastor and you come to these councils by yourself, you're cheating yourself. You got to bring your teams. Otherwise, you'll have to go back and translate it for them. You know, because there's going to be some no-filter speaker like me who'll say stuff, and, and that greeter's going to hear me say that, and he's going to stop prophesying up there and actually start loving people. So you want to bring people with you. Otherwise, it's like the parents eating, expecting the baby to live. But you got to take some chances. You got to be a risk taker. See, when you're 100% sure, you're too late. What risks are you going to take? Are you going to play it safe? Are you into the policy of appeasement? Appeasement is keeping everyone happy. As long as you're trying to keep everyone happy, I can tell you nobody's going to be happy. 
especially you, because you know you're settling for the lowest common denominator. And as long as your project is to keep people happy, that is not what God's called you to do. He's given you a mandate. He's given you a mission. He's given you a vision. He's given you a direction. He's given you a platform. He's given you equity. He's given you credibility. He's given you gift of communication. He's given you the word. He's given you the spirit. And he's given you all the resources. And now you're going to play it safe. See, there was a time the churches used to play to win. Now we just play to not to lose. And we start playing defense. And that simply means that only teams that are ahead in the score start playing defense and start playing in such a way that we, we just want to keep everyone happy. And I want to tell you that that's not what God has called you to do. He hasn't called you to be a jerk or a jerkess. I didn't want to leave anybody out. <laughs> because I know how it is nowadays. Like, what about me? Don't leave me out. I don't want to leave you out. So jerks and jerkess. Then the whole notion of what risk do you need to take? Where are you playing it safe? Are you getting younger? Are things getting easier? And then we say things like, you know, as soon as this gets done, right after that, you know, I'll do that in January. We keep just delaying the inevitable. Imagine, Im imagine, imagine if you go to the doctor today and he says, you got cancer, you got cancer in your right shoulder, you got cancer in your right shoulder. And he says, but I've got, got good news for you. I can remove it all surgically. You will not have chemo, uh, radiation, nothing. I can get it all out for you. Do surgery. And then he says to you, I have an opening next Tuesday for surgery. You know how you get an opening? That quick, somebody died. So it's not a testimony time like, God opened a door for me. No, somebody had to leave for you to get in there. So the doctor says, I, I'm, I can do surgery next Tuesday or the next opening I have is in November. Which opening are you going to take? Tuesday. Huh. Why? Why not wait till November? Because if you leave the cancer alone, what's going to do? It's going to spread. And it's going to eventually do what? Kill you. There are some folk in your church who need to be surgically removed. <laughs> and you know who they are. You know, most churches are just two funerals away from revival. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When you're a pastor visiting the hospital, it's pretty conflicted, right? <laughs> the Lord giveth. The Lord taketh away. Ooh, may it happen. <laughs> but we keep putting that cancer off. The two-legged cancer. And the longer you keep the cancer around, it's doing what? Spreading. Right now, they would leave and take five people with them. November, they're going to leave and take 15 people with them. They're going to take the whole arm with them. But you know what we do? We just kind of rock along and saying, you know, let God take care of it. No, God ain't going to take care of that. He put you there. Is the whole notion of what chances are you willing to take? Because leadership, especially in church, is not in that. What is that Greek word I used in the first session? No, that was the Hebrew word. And the Greek word was wuss. Yeah, keep the Hebrew and Greek separate now. Don't. By logos, you know. <laughs> the Hebrew word is funky. The Greek word is wuss. If you don't have courage, then it'll be hard to lead in a church. So with that in mind, let me give you three more words and then I'm done with you. About 10 more minutes then I'm finished. In case some of you are having a hard time staying awake, I am too. It'll be... <laughs> Here we go, three words. Hard work, 
hard work, homework. Hard work, hard work, homework. Hard work, hard work, homework. Everyone together. Hard work, hard work, and homework. Let's talk about those three, and then I'm done. And then tonight we start at 7 o'clock. I'm going to talk about the pain of leadership. Hard work. There's no harder work on this planet than ministry. No harder work. As a professional, you see more of the wear and tear of life than any other professional. A lawyer sees you for legal needs. A doctor sees you for physical needs. Your insurance agent sees for insurance needs. Your uh, psychiatrist sees you because you're crazy. Uh, your, your car mechanic sees you for car needs. Your plumber sees you because something going on with your plumbing. But you, as a minister of the gospel, see more of the wear and tear of life than anybody else. You see when babies are born and you see when mothers are dying. You see when people move into a new house and you see when they're being evicted. You see people when they get a new car, you see when they're being repossessed. You see when they have a job and they don't have a job. You see them when they're up and they're down, when they're well, when they're in the hospital, when the kids are doing well and when you're helping bail out their kids out of prison at 3 o'clock in the morning. You see them when they're getting married, you see them when they're getting divorced. You see them when they're serving the Lord and you know when they are on the slippery path away from the Lord. You see more of the wear and tear of life than anybody else. You see them from the womb to the tomb. You see them at the highest and you see them at their lowest. And it's nonstop. It's 24-7, 365. But if you're in the ministry full time, you'll never have another holiday. You'll never have another vacation the rest of your life. You, so I call you, say, where, where are you? I'm on a cruise somewhere, Alaskan cruise, Mediterranean cruise. I'm on a cruise. No, you're not. You're still Facebooking your church. You're still tuned into there. You're still checking your phone, your emails, and your messages. You're never off. If I was a plumber and I wanted to take a vacation, I could shut it down. And have a vacation. Go with my family. Shut down my phone. Shut down my email. Shut it down. You'll never get to do that. If that light bulb was on all the time and never went off, what will happen to that light bulb eventually? It's hard work. It is very hard work. It's extremely hard work. It's the hardest work on this planet. Ministry is hard work. If you're allergic to hard work, this is not for you. It's not like this is how many hours you put in. If you start counting hours, you'll be very depressed. <laughs> you'll be looking for some good stuff to smoke, you know? <laughs> Go with some of your greeters and ushers and have a party. <laughs> They're like, what are you smoking? Can I have one? <laughs> it's hard work don't be jealous of another pastor it's hard work number two it is hard work it is hard work hard work in ministry people will disappoint you in ministry people will betray you in ministry people will lie about you in ministry people will start rumors about you in ministry, people walk over your heart. The people you help the most will be the first to leave. And it will start creating scar tissue on your heart. Keep your heart clean. Forgive everybody. Don't let somebody else hold you back. Don't wait for them to come and ask for forgiveness. Just let it go. Just let it go. Let it go. I, I think, I, th I think, I think, 
the best worship song that came on the American scene was about three years ago. And I think every church should sing it at least one Sunday a month. Came from the movie Frozen. <laughs> one, two, three. <laughs> enough, 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 enough. <laughs> I think once a month, every church ought to sing that song. <laughs> Let it go. I think that should be the number one song on your playlist. <laughs> As a pastor, that's the best worship song you can have. Don't let people, who, you know, many people who leave your church are like skunks, 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 skunks. You can run them over, but you'll know they've been there. <laughs> Don't you wish some, the right people are in the room right now? Bring them next year. <laughs> and tell us what you want us to say to them. We will say whatever. We'll prophesy whatever you pay us to do. So. Okay, I'll give 50% of that to missions, okay? <laughs> oh, yum, yum. Am I coming back tonight? <laughs> it's not his fault, so... Just leave him alone if, if, you, if you think I'm being sacrilegious. I am, but leave him alone. <laughs> heart work. Keep your heart clean. Keep your heart pure. Don't let anybody have that much power over your heart. You know, they've moved on with their, their lives. Move on with yours. Because many people will leave your church and you'll wonder why did they leave? What happened? What went wrong? There are some mysteries that are not be solved. You might see them in heaven, maybe, maybe not. And you can ask them, if you don't see them, you know what happened. If you see them, it won't matter. You'll be glad you made it. Number three, homework. Homework, homework. How many of you married? Can I see your hands again? Married people, married people, married. Majority of you are married. If you're married, stay married. The most important people you're going to take to heaven are not your church members, are your family members. If you're married, don't mess around with somebody you're not married to. Your greatest testimony is not the size of your church, but the size of your home. Because a mega ministry needs a mega marriage. You see, the only thing that you really have that nobody can take away from you, but you can give up freely, is your name, your reputation, your honor. It's got to be some kind of crazy sex for those 35 seconds. It's like, ooh, take it all. Take my family, take my wife, take my husband, take my children, take my grandchildren, take my church, take my reputation, take my honor, take it, take it, take it. It's got to be some kind of crazy sex to give it all away. Give it all away. See, see the, see, the, see, see, the Bible gives us the anatomy of sin, the three steps of sin. In Psalm 1, 1, it says, and the three postures, blessed is the man who walketh not, and then he said, who does what? Sitteth not, and then, no, uh, who standeth not, and then he, what? Sit. So those are the three postures of sin. So if there's a naked woman over there, and I see her and I keep on walking. It's cool. I didn't ask her to take her clothes off. I keep on walking. I'm cool. When I stand over there and say, Mama Mia, God, you are on your game. And when I sit down, it's too late. 
See, in, in church world, we have created a vocabulary, something like we say, he fell into adultery. Help me understand that. I'm walking along, loving Jesus, loving my family, loving my children. I fell. Is that what happened? That slippery slope started way back there. See, it will not matter what the preacher says at your funeral. Because all preachers lie. If you haven't li uh, been done a funeral, if you haven't lied at a funeral, you've never done a funeral. <laughs> I mean, when was the last time you heard someone say, and this jerk <laughs> bust hell wide open. <laughs> burn, baby, burn. <laughs> no, we'll fix it. So there you are laying. First of all, I've told my, you know, it's, I'm not going to lay like this. I'm going to go out like this. <laughs> I don't want any church music. I want some sweet jazz. I don't know if I'll have jazz up there, but I know I'll have church music forever. He's a good, good father. A good, good father. It's like Father Abraham, you know? I mean, how many times can you sing that? <laughs> and I want people to cry. I don't want no celebration of life service. This is a very expensive party. <laughs> I'm paying for it. I'm not even there. I want people to get squirt bottles when they're coming in. I want people to cry. By the way, all that is in writing already. My entire funeral is written out. Uh -huh. Everything is written out. My family's agreed to all that. I almost want them to put a toothpick in my mouth. But I think some people might misunderstand that. So, uh, <laughs> so it really doesn't matter what people say at your funeral. You know what will matter? Is what my wife says about me at my funeral. He's a good guy, kind of crazy. Said stuff from the pulpit he should not have. <laughs> Embarrassed people. He provided for us. He worked hard. Good guy. Good guy. Good guy. I don't want children to say, Dad was crazy. Uh, but Dad was the same everywhere. He was the same in the parking lot. He was the same in the church. He never talked down to anybody. He respected everybody. He had conversations with mega church pastors and People who don't even have any position in the church. It really didn't matter to dad. Dad was okay. Dad was cool. We went for money to mom, but dad was okay. Because see, it's your home life that really defines where the church goes. Three more minutes I'm done, then I want to pray for marriages. The enemy from day one in the garden has been after the family. The enemy knows that if he can take the family out, I'm talking about your families, if he can take your family out, he can take the church out. Every one of us, every one of us in this room, and I don't know if people are watching me online right now, but every one of us in this room and online know of somebody who messed up. Keep your zipper up.
Because see, your greatest testimony is not how many you have in the church. What your budget is and what your location is. To God be the glory for all of those things. But your greatest testimony is your home life. You don't want your husband, your wife, or your children sitting in the church saying, but that's not how it really is at home. Because they see everything. They may not say much, but they see everything. They are smart kids because they are your kids. They are smart kids. And my prayer for you is that may your churches flourish, may your churches grow, may you have more baptisms and more salvations and more people being filled with the Holy Spirit and more prophetic words and may, may, may you be all of that. But my real prayer is that may your marriages be secure. The enemy is after your home. Because if you can take out the shepherd, he can scatter the sheep. He was after Adam and Eve. And he has not let up yet. And every one of us knows people who at one time were on platforms like this. But now they are not. Simply because they couldn't keep their zipper up. Now that doesn't sound very deep to you. But I tell you that's the strength of the church. The strength of the church is a strong pastoral family. A strong ministerial family. Strong families that demonstrate how you make it through thick and thin. How you're true to each other. How you live a pure life. How your home integrity is never in question. And how you cherish the closest people to you. Lord, I want to pray for families right now. I want to pray for marriages right now. The enemy started in the garden destroying the family. Fight among children, Cain and Abel. And from then we see on and on and on and on, including David, Solomon, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Everyone somehow losing it on the family front. Let that not be true for us in this room and those on online. So Lord, I pray for homes, ministry homes, leadership homes, ministry marriages, leadership marriages that will remain pure, will remain integrous, and will be people who will not bring shame and embarrassment to your good name. We surrender our marriages to you. May you Help us keep our marriages strong. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. How many of you just, just as an, an interest, how many of this was your very first time to hear Dr. Sam Chan live? Raise your hand. You see that, superintendent? I mean, good night. Wow, how many of you will, will honestly be able to say you'll remember this day the rest of your life? I mean, something said, something happened. I was just kind of sad that I was back there and my wife was down here because, you know, we want that prayer for our family and for our marriages as well. And I'll never forget, I'll never, never forget the first time I ever heard this man. It was about 15 years ago and I was asking my wife, were we in Greenville, South Carolina or Atlanta, Georgia? I don't remember exactly where we were. We were in a small room. It was packed, small room, and the person sitting next to me was the head of Coca-Cola. And I thought, dear Lord, Coke goes places Jesus never has been. And this person is here, and I remember getting my stuff ready because I didn't really know what I was about to get. And that day, I was so blown away. I don't remember where it happened, but I will remember it for the rest of my life. And I want to say thanks for 
not just coming, but thanks for giving us some exposure. And I want to thank our superintendent. I mean, I want to thank him just as much as I do Dr. Chan. Because this guy, talk about chances. He made some chances. He changed our whole schedule up. He did things different. He brought Dr. Chan in. And, you know, wow. How many of you just say wow today? I mean, it's just wow. And, and I've always said this, and I don't mean it bad, but, you know, sometimes we have to reach outside of ourselves and get the things that we need because we don't have it all in our own little package. Now, you, you've, I know you've heard it said. But I've said if you, if you keep going to your family reunion to get your spouse, before long, all your kids are idiots. <laughs> Amen? And, man, alive. How many of you got us something fresh today? And I know, I know this man, in corporate circles, you're kind of like the ax guy. When he comes, somebody's losing their job. That's the truth. Am I lying? Am I telling the truth? You've been really nice today, but I've heard some other things about you. You've been really nice today. But, you know, he's dealing with church. And you know what? God wants us all to be nice, and he wants to save and touch every single one of us, not even one of us to not be touched and when you closed on family I was like man alive, I'm a, I got to make sure I got composure and I don't start crying back there I got to walk out here and help close but I know you see a lot of stuff I know you get calls and hear about a lot of stuff but if you could help us I just want you to touch just again on that element of family because I know I've got to meet your wife I've met I know one of your daughters, maybe both of your daughters, but I know that family is so important to you, not just your culture, but who you are. And so I'm just asking that he prays one more time because I was back there. I wasn't out here. And how many of you know our family is our church? You guys that are pastors know that family is not just what you do at your own house by yourself but it affects everything and it affects everybody and so so pastor is it okay can I can I ask him to pray for our churches you know there's some stuff here that you can catch I can help change your mind but he helps change your thinking and don't try to do something until your thinking is changed change your mind get your thinking changed this man is a thinking changer not just systems but he changes the way we think. And I want you to seal that because some of you, you're never going to forget this. You're not going to realize 15 years later how important today was to you in your life. Some of this stuff you're going to get later. You're not going to get it all today. You're going to get it later. But it's still going to be just as powerful. And so I want to ask you, Sam, would you, would you pray I'm for our families, for our churches? That. I want to do that. Lord, Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Lord, I pray for all of my families, mine included, that you'll surround us with a hedge, give us good sense. Help us to exit this earth if that is our way to go with honor. Help us to never bring dishonor to your name. You laid down your life for the church. Help us to keep it honorable, full of integrity. Let it be said that we took care of our families and our families were strong. So I pray for every family in this room and online, there are families who will know they are first, they are foremost, the most important. And our marriages, we will fight for our marriages. We will not let the devil get a toehold in our home. We rebuke the devourer. We take authority over our own homes. We are in charge of what you have given to us. This is what you have trusted us with. And so, we commit to you, O Holy Spirit, that with your help, our marriages will be strong. 
and our state of our union will be secure. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Also, I want you to, to pray one more. This, this, how many of you know that sometimes we invite the wrong people into our circles? How many of you know how important it is who you married? You know, some of us, we have people on our boards that affect not only our church, they affect our marriage as well. They affect everything around us. And this man's pouring his heart out so that you can help find the right people in the right programs in the right places, not just the right systems. But I want him to pray and to bless and to ask us to have the knowledge and the wisdom because you can hire Sam Chan, but I'm going to tell you, most of you can't afford him. But I believe we can learn and we can catch something from you. And so would you pray over our, our leaders and our churches and over, because some of you, you're going to be putting people, new people, in fresh places. And I want to ask for the blessing of God over that. Thank you, Lord, for calling us, choosing us, placing us, developing us, elevating us empowering us we thank you for that we also thank you for the people you bring into our lives this afternoon we ask you for discernment we ask you for discernment that allow us to be close to people you really want in our lives and also the discernment to stay away from those who bring lack and insecurity and threats and pessimism and negativism into our lives. Lord, I pray for leaders, especially pastors in this room who may be struggling, challenged with passive aggressive leaders, openly hostile leaders, leaders that are wanting to go backward rather than forward. Leaders who do not want to widen the canal or get new railroad tracks. Lord, I pray that you'll give them the courage to have the difficult conversations. The courage to know that the more we wait, the worse it gets. The courage to know that you call them to be pastors, leaders, stewards, in charge, overseers, the bishops of that house. Lord, I pray that you will empower us to walk in the anointing you've called us and not take on the mantle of those who don't want us to flourish. So Lord, I pray that you'll give peace of mind, security in heart, courage in our souls, and help us to look forward, realizing if God be for us, who can be against us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Y'all put your hands together for what the Lord's doing. This has been so good. I'm going to put just a, like a little cheap little plug in. You know, Sam also has something that I did a few months ago at the Porsche Training Center in Atlanta. You know, they, Porsche, they have a testing track in Georgia, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. They also have one in Germany. But he teaches on excellence, and he talks about excellence and the difference that excellence makes because, you know, it's just a hair between being good and being excellent, but there's a difference. And I tell you, some of you, I believe that just spending some more time with him, our pastor giving such a great introduction to bring him into our lives and into our ministries. You know, anything that you want, it's going to cost you some money. But you need to spend some money on you because a lot of people are depending on you. And so take the opportunity to grow. And thank you, thank you, thank you again to our superintendent for the brave chance that he took to say, let's do something different. Let's build our churches and let's grow them. Seven o'clock tonight, if you've got any board members, anybody close enough within driving distance, come. Like he said, don't cheat yourself by coming by yourself. The best is going to be tonight. God bless. I love you. Thank you so much. Y'all have a good meal. Come back ready. Amen. Ready, ready, ready.